Hi everyone, my name is Tyler. I am a clinical research coordinator with the Providence Brain and Spine Institute. I'm here today on behalf of ALS Northwest to give a sort of high level understanding of clinical trials, you know, what we're doing in these trials, what we're looking for, who qualifies, how to find them, and just kind of give you as much of a starting step to kind of get this going for you if it's something you're interested in. So clinical trials is a prospective biomedical or behavioral research study where participants are employed to answer a specific question about the biomedical or behavioral intervention. Um, we're going to be comparing the experimental treatment in the trial to one other. Most people know this as a uh, placebo group. So you can have a group to compare it to to see if anything from your experimental intervention, whether it be the drug, device, intervention, combination of therapies, whatever it may be, so we can see if it's effective or not. Down below, uh, I've included a couple examples um, from some studies that it's likely you guys have been familiar with or heard of in one form or another. Um, we have the Biogen Valor study where they were testing Tofircin, and we know that now by its market name as Qualsodi, which is the SOD1 uh, variation treatment that is currently being given to folks as an intrathecal injection. So that is a nice example of a kind of successful outcome. We also have Amalex here. You guys may be have heard in the news recently that unfortunately their Phoenix trial showed that the uh, Relivrio was not an effective therapy. And so they, they kind of had to back away from that one and, and we'll see if they end up trying to revamp it and come at it from another approach. And we have the Healy platform, the ever, ever present plugging and chugging platform where their kind of claim to fame is they have this overarching master protocol that we keep putting new regimens in. So that way it's a much quicker turnaround compared to the standard startup time, which could be several months at a time. So this helps, uh, you know, get options out there to our participants as quickly as possible. So a little bit of a high level overview of what clinical research is in general. Obviously, we are looking to advance our medical knowledge, whether it's based on pre-existing materials that we kind of only know a little bit of, or whether it's trying to kind of find all of the bits and pieces we don't know yet, um, as far as you know, progressions and onsets and who kind of is affected by what. And then ultimately, that'll kind of uh, guide us going forward on how we can detect and prevent these diseases and treat them as best as possible. And then, of course, the number one goal during any of these um, studies that you may come across, it's, it's safety first. So these studies are designed with safety aspects built into them. So that is always going to be um, a variable that you know we, we recognize is important and we got to do it in a mindful manner so that way we're not compromising any of our patients or participants in the name of finding an answer. And like we kind of touched on a little bit earlier, these studies, they're going to be drugs, they're going to be surgeries, devices, whatever it may be. And then we're going to use that mechanism to explore a possible treatment or a therapy and, and ultimately hopefully something that improves the conditions along the way. Um, I don't want this to sound like any coercion or anything like that, not to make anyone feel guilty. I know I have experienced this a lot with my participants in my studies. One thing that um, aside from a possible treatment that we do get to offer when we have these studies open is a lot of times my participants will explain that, you know, this is something that gives them hope. It gives them an opportunity to contribute. Hopefully, maybe it'll lead to something that will help others dealing with it later on. So personally, that is definitely a very rewarding component to getting to run clinical trials here. And then, of course, like we talked about earlier here, you know, safety being number one, 
just to kind of put everyone's mind at ease, all of these studies have to go through a review and approval from the IRB, that's the Institutional Review Board. So they're going to be verifying along the way, is this protecting patients? Is this protecting patients' privacy? Is this in everyone's best interest going forward? So that's something that needs to be dealt with and verified right out of the gate before we even approve it. And then that's something that's going to occur all along the way until the study is closed. So I'm including here um, the phases of the trials. It will be something beneficial to know if you ever have a discussion, if you have an interest, if you're approached on a trial based on the phase, it will kind of dictate a little bit of how the trial is performed. Um, since this is a talk about clinical trials, I've only included the four here. I'll go ahead and point out there is technically a fifth phase that's called the preclinical trials and that's like where they're working with bench tops or animal models and then once once that's been completed once they kind of sign off on the toxicology and stuff like that that's when it moves into phase one which you know is sometimes also referred to as first in humans so they're going to start with a much smaller population typically looking for healthy volunteers to kind of understand um, the drug's role in the human body, how it's metabolized, the, kind of the pharmacokinetics and stuff like that. And then once they've verified safety and tolerability, they'll move into the phase two, which is more of the efficacy version of finding out, does this therapy do anything at all? Is it going to be something that creates, um, they call it dis excuse me, statistical significance. You know, is this actually going to be benefiting patients long run or does it just kind of run hand in hand with someone who's not on any sort of treatment? Um, one of the kind of gold standards that we operate with, and that's mostly going to be in these phase twos and threes, is it's the, the double blinded randomized. So double blinded means neither the participant nor the research staff knows whether you're going to be on the active therapy, the experimental compound, or if you will end up in a placebo group. And earlier in one of the slides, we talked about, you know, they're comparing one treatment to another, and we mentioned that placebo group. So the placebo group is going to be essentially in the same cohort, go through the same study that these active participants are doing. So that way they can mitigate as many variables as possible and then you can see is there a trajectory is one group doing better than the other and then um, we can understand if this is a therapy worth going forward with or not and the randomized portion of that is um, regarding whether you end up in the active drug group or the placebo group we have no say over that you know there's there's algorithms in the study design behind the scenes that's going to plug them in and studies can kind of design those to be a little bit different based on the medications you're on, the gender that you have, your demographics, so that way they can kind of have a little bit more influence on keeping the groups as evenly as possible. Then phase three is it's just kind of like a larger version of the phase two, um, but this is the step that they take to go forward with you know, FDA approval and get it out to marketing and stuff like that and make it a uh, standard of care for folks who are living with any particular disorder that, you know, the therapy is intended to uh, treat. And then last but not least, we have the phase four. That's going to be your post-marketing study. That's going to be looking at long-term efficacy uh, because, you know, these phase twos and threes, they're going to be a matter of months, maybe up to a year or two. So phase four is going to be collecting that long-term data that wasn't going to be available in the previous uh, phase of the study. And then from there, they can sometimes decide, is this going to be a compound that we can use in other indications? So at this point, you know, let's jump into what it would be like as a participant. And the first thing first is, you know, how do I find a trial? Um, the best way, the easiest way right out of the gate, talk to your provider. Um, they will be aware if their clinic 
or hospital space or academic institution, whatever you may be operating out of, if they even offer clinical trials. You know, not um, not all providers or doctors are interested in being in uh, clinical trials. So if they have them, they'd be able to give you an understanding of what trials they look for. Sometimes um, if you're in a hospital or if you're in an academic setting, they're gonna be a little bit more open to doing those phase ones. Um, but if you get, you know, just like an outpatient clinic provider, typically you might see more of the twos and threes just because it's a little bit less invasive. And then if you're um, being followed by ALS Northwest or any other sort of association, by all means, definitely reach out to them. They will be an excellent resource for you as well. And then if you're a little bit more of a DIY person and you want to do some hunting and find something very particular, um, right here we have the clinicaltrials.gov website. It's going to be kind of your holy grail of information. It's going to have every single active study in the U.S. available to you. And um, they will be able to be refined based on your location or your study or the sponsor that you want to look up. Here we have a quick screenshot of the clinicaltrials.gov website. So like I said, you can, you can search based on the disorder you're interested in looking at. Um, if you have any specific terms, like maybe you want to do uh, a cell therapy or maybe you want to do an infusion, you can include some of those treatments in there to help narrow it down. And then of course, um, you'll want to ideally search for something locally because the, being a participant does take work and, and you will be kind of expected to be present. So ultimately you're gonna wanna find something as close to you as you can. Next step is, you know, do I qualify? Um, every study is going to be a little bit different based on who and what they're looking for, um, but kind of a, a standard expectation is you have officially received the diagnosis. Um, you may be in the midst of starting your care and maybe your provider hasn't quite decided that they're ready to give you the diagnosis. So that is one step that you will have to um, make sure is squared away before considering a trial because they want to make sure that the population that they have in these trials is very specific so that way they have sound evidence to say, yes, this treatment, this therapy, this drug, this device is going to work for this population. And so that's kind of the low fruit. Um, you have to have the diagnosis to be in the trial. And then, of course, like we talked about several times now, safety is their kind of number one priority along the way. So if you have um, we'll say uh, abnormal labs, or if you have um, a clinically significant um, heart condition going on, or if you have unmanaged diabetes, high blood pressure, those sorts of things, um, that will be, it's going to be up to the provider's discretion of what stability is, but if they are kind of actively working on getting something under control for your health, um, then you know at that given time it's probably not the best time to enroll in this experiment. So they will do assessments in your screening visit to make sure that you are in a good stable place before we kind of subject you to some more variables. And that's also going to include your medications, especially for those that are um, your disease specific medications, your standard of care. So since we're talking about ALS trials, um, if it's your Relivrio, your Radicava, if you have the SOD1, your Qualsodi, typically the kind of rule of thumb is if you've been stable on your final dose for at least 30 days, and they do this again to kind of mitigate some of those variables, if you're starting a brand new medication at the same time you're starting this experimental medication, it becomes a little bit difficult and muddies the water of whether we can say your symptoms changed because of this standard of care medication or was it this um, experimental medication we worked on. 
And then, like I said before, um, every study is a little bit different, so that's why I included this little last point about study-specific inclusion, exclusion criteria. And that can be all kinds of things from one study is going to have a cutoff at 50 years old, another study is going to have a cutoff at 80 years old. Um, some studies want brand new diagnoses, so maybe it's been three months since your symptom onset. Some studies will give you up to 36 months. So that'll be a, you know, a conversation that you'll have to go through with your provider or your study team to find out which, which trials you do qualify for. And then just to give you an idea of what it looks like to be a participant, um, that first bullet point, first steps first, it's going to happen at every trial that you come across. We're going to do the informed consent. Okay, so when you're initially approached, we're going to kind of give you a high level understanding of what this study is that we're presenting to you. And then, you know, we'll give you an opportunity to review the paperwork. It's going to explain who is running this study, what they're looking for, um, what are some of the risks, what are the benefits, and you're going to get a lot of um, material to sift through. So we typically give you, you know, a week or two to go through it and then understand and what you can understand, make sure you make some notes about any questions you do have did by your provider, or um, you may be able to be consented by, you know, one of us, like one of the research coordinators. Um, so it is a little study dependent, but we're, we're there to make sure you do understand what you're signing up for, and that way you're not surprised by anything, because like I said, being a participant will involve quite a bit of effort and we don't want this to be something that becomes burdensome on anyone. And then typically you'll see questionnaires all along the way. A lot of these you know, ALS trials, they will be including a questionnaire. I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with that ALS FRSR. That's typically used as one of those primary endpoints to suggest is this study um, or is this active compound, you know, effective and does it do what we want it to do. You'll also have a lot of lab work along the way. Um, you can kind of think of it in two components. Um, first, we're going to do safety labs. You're going to make sure that your health is protected all along the way. And then they'll look for things like biomarkers and blood work that'll show how the body is processing the uh, the compound, make sure it's not creating any toxic toxicity, how long it takes to go through the body, those sorts of things. And then other assessments, you know, we'll, like you see in the photo here, we'll do pulmonary function tests or you'll get some muscle testing. Um, if it's a drug that has a known cardiac side effect, you'll get some EKGs along the way. So it does run quite a spread of what kind of assessments will come into contact with as a participant. And then another thing that we're going to do at pretty much every single visit, we're going to check in with you about any changes you've had to your medications, whether those are prescriptions or over the counters. So that way we can check to see one, you know, are you taking any of those prohibited medications, which are obviously meds that the sponsor has decided they don't want interacting with this experimental medication, whether that's for um, safety purposes or whether they're trying to offset some of those, like I said, those variables that could um, muddy the water on being able to tell whether this is an effective therapy or not. And then equally, we'll, we'll do an adverse event review. Adverse events are they call them any untoward incidences that affect your health. That could be a rash. You can have some GI complications. You can have a fall. All of that is going to get tracked through the duration of your time as a participant in the trial. And then, of course, like what we talked about before, the study-specific stuff. So some studies will be really big, and you'll go through a lot of different assessments. Some studies will be a little bit smaller and streamlined. 
So that is going to be something that, you know, your study team will discuss with you along the way, as well as kind of preparing you for when they do the informed consent. And expectations, like I've kind of been alluding to um, throughout this presentation, it's I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off. It is, it is work. It is effort. We do what we can to make it as easy as possible on you, such as trying to schedule study visits when you're in town. Maybe you'll, you'll already be at the clinic for a standard of care so we can try and double them up so you're not making extra trips. But, you know, we, we do need some, some extra enthusiasm as a participant because it is going to be, you know, a little bit more of an ask from you guys. So like I said, you know, you're getting extra assessments, you're getting extra pokes to get some extra blood from you. So we just want to make sure right up front that you understand this, this is going to be an extra effort on you. And like I said, we're, we're checking in for your medications, we're checking in for your adverse events. Please, please, please make sure you're communicating with your study team so that way they can kind of keep everything organized and get that data into the sponsor in a timely manner. It kind of goes right into, you know, dependability. Um, we're trusting you to be able to make it to your appointments on time so we can do the safety work, so we can give you the next dose of the study drug. Um, so that way we can keep this data moving, make sure it's nice, clean data. So that way we can understand if, if this is a fruitful path to help, you know, people with these disorders. Um, flexibility, you know, we understand things come up all the time. It could be, you know, your schedule as a participant changes. You know, we, we have the same issue too, um, whether it's clinic space or if there was you know a serious adverse event that sometimes we need to pivot our attention to so please be flexible with us as your study team you know if we need to have you come in early or if you know you want to come in on a particular day but maybe the als interdisciplinary clinic is having their day that day so maybe you know maybe we need you to come in at nine in the morning kind of thing so we're, we're just asking that you keep in mind that there's a lot of moving pieces here and, and, and we need you to help us out as well. Um, and I did want to clarify that this information is, uh, I'm presenting it from a site in the US, so this is for sure applicable to US trials. Um, there has been some growing effort to kind of make the, uh, the European standards pretty similar, but I, I don't represent the European sites. I'm just kind of presenting this specifically as a US clinical trial site. 